Hello folks, welcome to one final edition for 2022 of Inside the Marvel Palace. Post Media's look at the Saskatchewan Legislature and politics in this province. I am Murray Mandrick, legislative columnist for the Regina Leader Post. Joining me as always, Jeremy Symes, our political reporter with uh, Leader Post and Star Phoenix. And a familiar face that's joined us all year. Thank you for doing so, Adam Hunter, CBC Provincial Affairs columnist, who has diligently been following the legislature as we all have. And this will be the last one for the year, guys. Thanks for joining us. Quick question to start out with. What was the best moment for the Saskatchewan party government this year? Jeremy, do you want to start? Yeah, no, I will. I will start. I don't know about best, but I think one of the important moments for them, I think this year was, and I don't want to make it sound like COVID is over or anything like that, but I think when they, announced they were removing those restrictions and kind of started downplaying a lot of the COVID stuff. It allowed them to kind of move forward on their own policy agenda that I don't think they were able to do for the last two years. So I'm thinking like the autonomy stuff and the meetings, the Saskatchewan First Act, and um, really kind of going after those things they really want to do. So I think that was one of the more important things for them to do this year. Whether or not it's a, a good thing for them, uh, what we'll see just depending on what we hear from First Nations and the federal government and all that kind of stuff. But I think um, them being able to move away from that COVID issue and maybe focus on some other stuff while also dealing with health issues and other things was maybe one of their the things they wanted to do that was good for them. I, I like the, actually the way you framed that. It was probably better than the question. You've learned something from those politicians in terms of answering the question you really want to answer as opposed to what to ask. ask. <laughs> Adam, either the best moment or the most important moment for the SAS party that you saw this year. Was it similar to what, you, what Jeremy was talking about? Because that, that actually was probably a pivotal time when they could get back on their agenda. Yeah, I thought it was ironic that you know, it's something that was horrible that's happening and still happening in the world, which is the Russian invasion in Ukraine, ended up being a boon for the provincial government. You know, they were able to balance their budget much sooner than they anticipated. And then a lot of that was attributed to the the invasion and, you know, commodity prices going through the roof. Um, so they're ahead of schedule on their balanced budget. They were able to pay down debt. Uh, that, that, helps them uh, you know reset the the next uh you know election cycle and say hey we're not no longer in a deficit we we balanced the budget we're in fact in a surplus well by the way we gave you 500 dollars checks that has to be mentioned as well you know even uh ndp leader carla beck saying that she can't really fault them for giving out the checks she can't badmouth that there's uh, they wanted the checks to come sooner and they maybe wanted you know kids to be included but the fact that people are getting five hundred dollars around Christmas time—that's that is something that doesn't rarely happen uh, for governments, and that's you know largely due to what happened you know over uh, you know overseas. And I think related to that is the government's uh, continuing uh, discussion about bringing in Ukrainians to Saskatchewan, flying them in, signing a deal to bring in five plane loads of people from who uh, are Ukrainians and are displaced and now living in Saskatchewan. And so I think those things go hand in hand and it's, it's uh, you know, very you know, sad that that is happening and that's something that, um, you know, affected the government's books in, in the way that it did and so dramatically. I don't think we expected that at the start of the year. At least that wasn't what we heard in March. I remember the finance minister saying, well, we don't know how this is going to affect us. We'll have to wait and see. And then just a few months later, it's a completely different story. And here we have you know, this huge surplus of money, uh, they're able to get $450 million out in checks and also pay down the debt. So I think those, the, the, the war in Ukraine and its effects on Saskatchewan specifically, I think is what I'll remember from this year. And it's something that, that helped the, the Saskatchewan party government. I, I agree with you. If I had to single, put it down to a single moment, I think I would probably put it down to the first quarter update for the 22-23 budget when they announced that massive turnaround. It's everything that you talked about, Adam, in terms of all of a sudden going from that $463 million deficit to what's now a $1.1 billion surplus. I think I have seen bigger surpluses, not many, but I don't think I've ever seen such a big turnaround in one year. So that in itself had to be a good moment, but there were bad ones too. So uh, Jeremy, either the worst uh, moment or the least productive moment or however you uh, would like to frame it what was what was the actually 
down moment for the government this year? Yeah, for sure. I think for the government, uh, it's a little more newer, but, you know, inviting Colin Thatcher to the throne speech. Um, I think that was just one of those issues where there was not a uh, daylight. Like people obviously understood what the problem was with that, inviting someone who was convicted of murdering his ex-wife. Um, and it just really... As they wanted to get and do their policy agenda, they wanted to move forward on autonomy. It was it just stopped them from doing that for about a week, and um, it was one of those things that um, yeah, no one could really see coming, but it has those ramifications. And I know people from all political stripes were upset with that. So I think that was one of those issues that was their worst where they were at. Um, I'm also. This happened in twenty late twenty twenty one, but it kind of it also had to do to my first point about uh, the convoy stuff. So when they were making those comments about being fed up with people not getting vaccinated, and then they kicked um, Nadine Wilson out of their caucus, I think that's one of those um, important moments that could eventually be bad for them. Potentially, it might have emboldened this right flank out there. Um, people who aren't happy with the, the vaccine policies and mandates that happen. So maybe by doing that and making that strong stance, they might have emboldened a, an angrier crowd, but we don't really know um, what kind of damage they'll do. But I think it's something maybe they, they wouldn't like. I know we're, I know they're watching it carefully and um, we'll see what, what they do going forward. What, what did you see as a low point, Adam? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, not to, I won't steal Jeremy's answer. I think I agree with what he said. I think um, there was a letter writing campaign. It seemed like uh, the government was very busy with their uh, their letters to the federal government. And they seemed to come, you know, fast and furious. I know that Jeremy and I probably have, you know, PTSD from writing about these these letters and yes. the reactions to them. <laughs> but the, I, I think the, there wasn't a lot of clarity about, let's say, the trespassing and, and scientists testing water. Um, the government wasn't able to give a lot of, uh, you know, examples of why this was so dangerous and something that needed to have a, you know, uh, order in council on the weekend, which I think is unprecedented to change a policy. Um, you talk about, you know, concerns about the, the Alberta Sovereignty Act. Well, this was cabinet deciding in a weekend to change a, a rule about trespassing that would affect federal government employees over something that's appeared to be very minor, maybe a, a, a you know a misunderstanding. Um, we had the letter about the gun buybacks from Christine Tell that was very strongly you know stating the government's not going to allow the RCMP to participate in this federal program. And I think the other one Jeremy mentioned the the, the convoy. You know, the so-called freedom convoy that was something that the the premier didn't really speak out against. And he received a lot of blowback from that. And I think, you know, there was another letter there about opening up the borders and how this is hurting, you know, our, 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 our economy. But there was pointed out that, you know, there's some much different comments made by the premier uh, when it's, uh, you know, when there's anti-pipeline protesters uh, or, you know, see our rail strike, let's say, um, that, that, that not necessarily consistent as far as, you know, what was being done at the border uh, in Ontario and Alberta as far as, you know, shutting down cross-border traffic and trade. So uh, the, the, the letter writing really stand up, stands out to me as something that the government was very targeted in doing. And I'm not sure uh, how, how, that, how that translated, how it worked out for them in the end. If I had to pick one, it would be that moment that Scott Moe penned that letter that basically in support of the Freedom Convoy. And But I, I think it's even more than that. That Facebook post that he made or or the or the press conference he made because he kind of made it about the same time last late january early february when he talked about how saskatchewan people are divided and no one had been more discriminated against than the anti-vax uh, crowd whether they were uh, uh legitimately protesting or not it was such a bad change of form for scott moe who i thought for much of 2021, had a handle on at least what had to be done in COVID, knowing full well that, that restrictions needed to be put in place. I thought it was a very weak moment for him. Another one I'd cite is one uh, is a low moment for government was probably that day in Camsack, Jeremy, when uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah right. when when uh, in essence it wasn't the premier, but it was uh, uh, rural and uh, and northern uh, health associate minister. Uh, Everett Henley and MLA Terry Dennis were just absolutely accosted by angry residents 
uh, of CAMSEC over the closure of their emergency service. And that was going on all summer. Probably one of the better moments is when they started fixing that and had the money to do so because of uh, of, of that. The $60 million for uh, health recruitment and retention is a big deal, even if it's only a temporary deal, but it certainly relieves the pressure on those particular issues. Uh, so they actually, hard not to have good moments when you've actually had this turnaround in budget, record population growth, uh, at least since the quarterlies were reported, still a problem with uh, uh, out migration to Alberta and everything else. It's all being driven by immigration, but that's still a good thing. And uh, uh, record job growth really uh, coming out of the pandemic, partly once again, because uh, the pandemic, there was so many jobs lost and, and now they're being regained. So there was actually a lot of really good moments for the government, but as you guys point out, a few low points. But let's also look at the NDP. What, what was what was their highlight of the year um, in in terms of of things that move them forward? Let's start, Jeremy. What do you think? Yeah, I think the important moment for them this year was electing new leader Carla Beck. You know, I think this was after we saw Ryan Miley go, and that's obviously their low point. We'll get into that, but. I think they they lost Ryan and then they kind of went through some tumult, a little a, a little spicy leadership campaign with Caitlin Harvey, more spicy than maybe we've seen in the past. And then now we have Carla Beck. And I think that was an, that's an important moment for them as a party to have this new leader and um, get behind this new leader and set the direction that they want to go in. Um, wherever that is, we're, we're still kind of seeing what that's going to be. But I do think that was really important for them to kind of just move on from uh from ryan miley um get over the the caitlin harvey issues with with their party which they might still see and just try and forge ahead with uh, a new plan and uh continue to reach out to these groups that um maybe they haven't been in rooms before i know carla says that a lot so i think that would be their highlight this year do you agree adam like it's certainly it was the biggest ndp political story this year because anytime you change leaders that that do but do you, do you also see that as sort of the sort of the high water mark for the NDP this year? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll piggyback on that by just saying that in addition to you know you know maybe rejuvenating the party in a way you know you know t- taking it in a different direction perhaps you know having having the first ever ever uh, woman lead the party I think is significant uh, for Saskatchewan and and for the NDP and uh, you know we're behind other provinces when it comes to that you know quite behind actually. And I think when you, you know, just climbing on that as well as, well as Nathaniel Teed winning the, uh, the, the subsequent yes, uh, by-election that, that violate that, uh, with the, the vacated seat by Ryan Miley, that, you know, that wasn't a gimme necessarily. You want to hold on to that seat, but I know going in, there was someone that had run before for the Saskatchewan party. You had Jeff Walters in the race as well. We didn't know how that was going to work. Mark Friesen, who we know about. So I, I think the NDP winning that, you know, pretty convincingly, uh, is something that, that helped Carla Beck sort of prove that, okay, you know, this is my party now, people are with us. Uh, by-elections, of course, are are tricky to kind of judge as one-offs, but it was a by-election that started this sort of arguably into this direction as well earlier in the year. So I think, you know, the first female leader, you know, Nathaniel Teed is, you know, the first openly gay uh, MLA, I think is also, you know, something that's, that's pretty remarkable for Saskatchewan as well. So I think those are two things I think that, that would stand out to me for the NDP is, you know, Finding new leader, as Jeremy said, but also first first woman to lead them, and then winning that by election. I think the low mo- point for the NDP for me was losing Athabasca in February, a seat that they have held for every year except two since 1971. Like I mean, that's almost as old as I am, uh, and and that that that's a ridiculously long time uh, to hold a seat. And if there were there was a stronghold, it was probably that one. And obviously that same week. Uh, that led to the resignation of of Ryan Miley uh, is sort of a low point. So I'll I'll deal with my low points uh, immediately. In terms of the highlights, though, uh, I think one of the things that was sort of less of a specific event or a specific day for the NDP, but I think it'll resonate, was Carla Beck's summer tour. Because I think she actually, if didn't, directly connect with enough people because you never do on a summer tour i think she showed the party the need to connect with a larger swath of rural saskatchewan than perhaps they had been under ryan miley who had a certain appeal to urban saskatchewan had a certain appeal to uh a certain political voices but uh, but i i think if you're going to look back in history as to where the ndp 
if they do turn around, did turn around, it'll be that reconnection with rural Saskatchewan, with people in communities, with, with uh, people other than than what has become their established clientele, uh, which is sort of the, you know, the inner city urban, usually reasonably affluent, et cetera. They need a lot more than that to win the election. Uh, but let, let's talk about that for a minute. What do, you, what do you guys think were the NDP low points this year? Marie, I think you already touched on it, but I was going to mention, you know, losing Athabasca, right? Like that was the by-election that ultimately resulted in Ryan Miley stepping down. It was one of the reasons why he did. And I think um, that that just had huge ramifications for the party. It, it did set off, um, I guess, Carla back taking it on a new direction. So that's where I think the biggest low point uh, was for them. Um, I guess the, the 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 alternate argument is it's a by-election. We never know how these things go. They don't matter. But I do think this one did really matter, like you mentioned, um, just because they usually they usually do win it. Yeah. What about you, Adam? I don't have really a, a, anything other than that. I'll I'll just add that I think you know the Ryan Miley, you know, stepping down that sets off a lot of like a bit of party turmoil, a bit of soul searching, a bit of infighting as Jeremy had reported on really well earlier in the year. And, and that's, we're kind of, still kind of seeing that. I think that's not really, it's sort of bubbling under the surface, but um, you know, with a, a party with so few seats in the legislature and so much work to do to kind of build itself back up, they can't afford to be, you know, fighting amongst themselves uh, too much. I mean, some of it is obviously healthy. You want to, you know, refresh the party and figure out what you stand for. But um, there's only so much of, the, of that you can take when you're trying to take on this, you know, juggernaut in the SAS party. So I think, I think Ryan stepping down, that was something that was, that was, you know, you don't want your leader ever to leave. And, you know, you can argue about his merits, but that's, that's obviously a low point. And, and I, I think that kicked off a lot of, um, you know, infighting and, and, and bad blood between, you know, certain factions or parts of the party. But I think Carla Beck has said they're kind of fighting their way out of that and they're trying to mend fences. So we'll see how that plays out in 2023. I, I, I kind of agree. And I, I, another one would probably be Caitlin, Caitlin Harvey's whole entire campaign. Not necessarily that uh, they shouldn't have an alternative view because they clearly do need to. But in sometimes it was sometimes a pre- presented in, in at least from my perspective in a kind of a destructive way basically saying that you know at various times that this party as it stands right now does not uh, stand for what we stand for and she did get 35 percent of the of, of support from someone who basically out there whether they're long-standing new democrats or not or just people she recruited but a significant voice out there that basically said the same thing she did this party just doesn't stand for enough and i'd further extend that to that day when they voted against the Saskatchewan Act on second reading. Uh, and the reason I say that, not because there was any significance to that, because to this day there still isn't. It was a tempest in a teapot argument, etc. But what it did do was somewhat confirm, I think, suspicions some people had about Carla Beck not willing to take a strong stand on particular issues. And I think that's going to haunt her into 2023 and beyond. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see where she comes, uh, uh, how she comes across in the following year and into the election. Although I have to admit, there were days in the House where she seemed a lot more determined and stronger in presentation and stronger on issues than uh, than I thought she would be. So uh, I, that'll be something I think will be also kind of really interesting to look forward in the coming year. Uh, what, did, what did you guys enjoy most? What's what, what's the one story? that you think back and say, I really had fun covering that because, uh, and it doesn't have to be a good news story. It doesn't have to be a bad news story, but, but something that was kind of fun. So we'll start with you, Jeremy, what, what story did you enjoy most? Oh man, that's a good question. There was, there's quite a few, I mean, politically, I think actually going to Campsack was really fun. I know it was a lot of turmoil and it wasn't good for the government, but actually being there, there's this huge protest and you're watching like, democracy kind of happened you're or i don't even know you're you're seeing yeah it uh, is pe- like people yelling at their elected representatives and the elected representatives are trying to raise in and it's just there's so it's so tense and it's um it's just really kind of cool to be a part of and witness just as like a fly on the wall in a way um and just really sharing that story and just taking people there was so much fun um just as a political thing i 
I wrote a, a series just about water issues in the province and it's not really related to anything in the ledge too much, but it was just super fun to go out there and just meet with folks about a, an issue, an environmental issue that um, won't go away, but people are really passionate in reading. So that was, that was really fun for me. What did you, what did you have fun, the most fun doing this year besides working with me, Adam? Like, you know, which I was going to say, hang out with you guys and the rest of the, the press gallery is <laughs> yeah. really definitely the highlight. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to cop out a tiny bit because I think, um, you know, I, I wouldn't just necessarily describe a lot of the stuff we cover as fun I, all the time. Yeah. And sometimes the stuff that's the most, you know, quote unquote, interesting or, or, or get you kind of get you going a little bit is something that happens where you don't expect it. It's, it's unexpected. Um, you know, we talked about the Thatcher thing. Um, that's something that kind of blew, blew up in the moment. And then for days afterwards, and we're still talking about it. Uh, I think just in general, being back at the legislature and being able to see people come out uh, for certain causes or issues, meet them face to face, hear their stories. That's important. And that's sort of what this is about and not to like soapbox it, but, um, there's only so much you can do from, you know, not seeing people, not seeing people affected by real issues. And we went for quite a long time without that. And now that that's back, it, you know, it's, it's nice that we're able to, to, to do that. Um, and I think just, you know, there's other, other moments where, you know, I know you guys covered, you know, Brad Wall's uh, yeah, portrait fine. thing. That's one of those things where, and we see it from time to time, it happens in the legislature more than people I think appreciate is when there, there are some, you know, partisan squabbles are put to the side and you hear people come forward and, 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 you know, in this case, they're honoring Brad Wall, but it happens other times when, when you're working on issues, I, I've talked about bringing Ukrainians to Saskatchewan. That's something that both parties are obviously aligned on. So anytime that happens, I like writing about those things because it kind of shows that this building, this, 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 <laughs> this process can work. Um, and I think, you know, there are, you know, there's some tragedies this year in the province. And I think the response to that, you know, in the coverage was, was, was fairly positive. And, and I'm interested to see how that, that specific incident, James Smith is is uh, responded to by the government specifically, because I think the pressure will continue to be on them to see what they do and and how they respond to it. And and it's gonna be on the federal government as well, and they're gonna have to work together. And that's another thing I think we have to keep an eye on because we already talked about the federal government, the provincial government are kind of always at odds together, but there's quite a few issues where they actually do have to work together and healthcare costs are another one, healthcare spending. So, um, We'll be looking for that in the next in next year as well. I know what you're saying about James Smith. And people sometimes don't get that this about what we do because we do so much stuff that's controversial or nasty or or whatever. But even in the worst moments, and James Smith and and the murders that were that happened at that particular time, the tenseness around the manhunt was just an absolutely horrific thing for the province to experience, a horrific thing for people to cover. But you get to see the strength in people. And the, the strength of the people in, in Weldon, the strength of the people on the James Smith Cree Nation still blows me away. The, the press conference in Saskatoon that was held afterwards still resonates with me and sort of something that, uh, uh, that I'll remember. One of the stories that I think I had most fun with, mostly because it came at a very tense time on a tense issue, but was so damn funny, was the whole issue of, uh, of the teaching of... Uh, uh, the Loch Ness monster uh, being proof that dinosaurs live with with man, and why I love that story is because it was in the middle of this incredibly serious issue of allegations of abuse at Legacy School, and it seemed to be a little bit of an icebreaker. The government didn't handle it particularly well, and uh, I, I won't lie, it's kind of fun when you do stories when things when the politicians are on the hot seat and they're not handling things particularly well, but. Uh, I, I remember that story as just being sort of kind of a fun one to cover, a fun scrum to cover. Uh, yeah, I think even in some ways, Minister Duncan had a little bit of fun with it when he was talking about his Scottish heritages and simply refusing, refusing okay. to deny the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. I get that. You know? so, <laughs> but Marie, it also brought you back to your childhood, yeah. being able to swim with the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. So. <laughs> and walk with dinosaurs, which I clearly have done, <laughs> which you have pointed out on several like, occasions. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. Let's wrap this up by looking forward to 2023 and i guess what i'd like to know and maybe people should think look look for is what story do you think from 2022 is going to resonate the most into 2023 i'll start with you jeremy 
I have a couple, but I'll start, I think, the uh, with the FSIN and the Saskatchewan First Act and Indigenous groups either talking about blockades or court action um, or other measures they're going to do against this thing. I think that's something we're going to have to really watch. Um, and it, in Alberta, if you look next door, the Onion Lake Cree Nation is already taking Alberta to court over the Sovereignty Act. They'll do the same thing with Bill 88 um, if the legislation passes here. So it's definitely not going to go away. And it's one of those relationships that the government here is going to have to really work on. You know, they they love to go after Ottawa, but now they're going to have to actually take some of this Indigenous, uh, these groups a lot more seriously and work on that too. Um, Don Bray wrote a really good column. Yeah, I recommend good. people uh, read it just because it kind of talks about that. Uh, just another one real quick. I think uh, going to 2023, it'll be doctors, healthcare staff. Um, this whole issue of uh, fixing our hospitals is not going away anytime soon. It's the healthcare money that Adam's talking about. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to continue to write about issues in our healthcare system, most definitely. And uh, I'll be interested to see if they strike some new deal with doctors to pay them differently to improve things and see what more happens out of their $60 million plan. How about you, Adam? What do you think going forward in uh, the USON 2022 is, is, is going to move forward into the next year that, that will resonate more with people than maybe uh, uh, one would thought would have resonated a year ago when it wasn't, these things weren't much of an issue? Yeah, great answer by Jeremy. So that that's uh, <laughs> the, the, I, I agree. I agree there. I, I think um, I'm going to start watching for, you know, the political, you know, behind the scenes to see, you know, we're getting we're one year out of it we will be one year out of, out of an election. Who's who's positioning themselves to run again? Which of these SAS party cabinet ministers or MLAs who've been around for quite a while are going to you know decide to hang it up? Um, is that going to be the case for some NDPers who've been around a while and maybe see themselves as not wanting to be in opposition for another four years if, you know, the polls and the trends we're seeing hold, because that's what happened last time. Um, it'll be something that'll be interesting. Also, you know, that the government's made so much about the budget and they, they uh, their projection in March for what they see out of this out of this war and, and the way the markets are right now and, and how they plan to uh, help people in Saskatchewan because I think affordability is going to be a major issue. We talked about healthcare; these things are all tied in, and if people can't afford stuff, they're they're going to continue to call their MLAs. They're going to continue to come to the legislature. They're going to continue to be issues that are top of mind for every everyone. And the government hasn't ruled out another round of five hundred dollar checks. They're not certainly not saying they're going to do it. But if we see another, you know, windfall revenue in the pressure to, to help people out with cost of living, grocery prices, cost to heat, heat their and power their homes, I think that's going to continue into into next year. And, and it's definitely a trend we're going to see for the next couple of years and how those how the parties handle that. It's definitely, I would say, the number one message from the uh, opposition under Carla Beck is affordability. That's something they've hammered um, previously. Ryan Miley's obviously, I think part of it was 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 because of COVID was healthcare. It was, he's a doctor, so that was where he was comfortable. The government's going to have a, a you know, a, it's it's going to be a, a fight to convince people that they're doing enough to make life affordable. And they say growth that works for everyone. That's their that's their big you know current slogan. Um, if people aren't seeing that, the pressure is going to continue to mount on them, and they they don't want to slip up from where they're at. They have a strong majority right now, but. I'll be looking to see, you know, what's to come as far as relief and spending plans. And there'll be pressure on them to spend because, as Jeremy mentioned, healthcare, and I talked about it, I don't want to just continue to bring that up again. I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, but that one's just, it's, it's staring everyone in the face and it's it's nonpartisan. It's something that everyone sees as an issue. And um, whether the federal government chips in money or not, it's something the provinces have the responsibility for, uh, first and foremost. And that's going to continue to be pressure uh, for for the provincial government. So we'll see how they handle it. Uh, good points. Uh, I'll, I'll get the last word because colonists never get the last word. So, so just on this one rare occasion, let, let the colonists have the last word. Uh, I, I think I really am looking forward or am very interested in to see how Scott Moe plays off Daniel Smith in the coming year because she represents the right wing concerns that he is facing. I think they're far more intense and widespread in Alberta, but I think they're still a big deal. So whether Daniel Smith does particularly well in the election or particularly poorly, uh, it's uh, going to be a big indicator for Scott Moe come May when Albertans vote as to what direction 
the province will go for the rest of the year. And I think he's being rather cautious right now of trying not to be too much like Daniel Smith, but trying to also capture what appeals she has that resonates with his own voters in, in, in largely uh, rural areas of Saskatchewan, although perhaps in some urban areas too. But at any rate, we've gone way over time because this has been so much fun. Thank you guys for the whole entire year for the fine work that you do. Uh, I don't know if people understand how hard people in this business actually work and, and, and uh, how tough it is, but I don't think they know how much fun it is either. So Adam, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us here and we'll look forward to seeing you guys in 2023. It was a pleasure. Thanks guys. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy new year. <laughs>